You are listening to Real Foot Forward, a West Tennessee podcast. This episode is made possible by Buddy's Record Service in Union City, Tennessee. Request the best and call Buddy's for all your auto needs. Today's guest is Matt Marshall, CEO of United Way of West Tennessee. This is Scott Williams, the host of Real Foot Forward, where every single week we talk about the people, the history, and the culture of our home right here in West Tennessee. Today, I've got an incredible guest uh, to chat with, and I'm a little bit intimidated because I've been watching him interview people all weekend, and so I'm uh, a little nervous, so hopefully he can give me some pointers afterwards. Uh, Welcome Matt Marshall, who's the president and CEO of the United Way of West Tennessee. Welcome, Matt. Yeah, thanks uh, so much, Scott, for uh, letting me be on with you. Uh, I don't know about all that pressure. Uh, (laughs) I don't think I'm a great interviewer personally. I I just try to do the best I can. Well, we're going to talk a little bit um, in a while about um, how you're using social media uh, to talk a lot about racial justice and to get some questions and answers and uh, get people listening to issues on race in West Tennessee. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But first of all, let's back up to the very beginning to Little Matt. Um, yeah. where are you originally from? I know nothing about you. So, uh, yeah, when it yeah. comes to your childhood, so fill us in. Yeah. So I actually am uh, born and I was born and raised right here in West Tennessee, uh, in Jackson. Uh, in fact, I'm a fifth generation Jacksonian. Uh, and so my great, great grandfather, Jack Marshall, uh, came and planted roots, um, here in West Tennessee shortly after the civil war. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, that, that's, you know, uh, we have been here for quite a while. Um, so I love West Tennessee. Uh, it's my home. Um, I did leave for a couple of years uh, during college, uh, but actually came back and finished my degree at Union University, uh, which is actually where I started. Uh, and that's a whole nother story. But um, but yeah, so pretty much all of my um, education has come exclusively in West Tennessee. Um, and so I have both a, a my bachelor's degree and my master's degree from Union. Uh, my, uh, my, uh, my bachelor's degree was in Christian ethics uh, from the School of Theology and Missions, but my um, uh, master's degree in education. And so I love education. I love history. I love all those things. Uh, and so I'm really passionate about that. But first and foremost, I'm passionate about West Tennessee and about our community. I'm curious where you went. Yeah, so I went to Arizona, uh, and so uh, University of Tucson there, in, uh, in, or University of Arizona in Tucson, uh, and so I was there for a couple of years and, and really loved it, um, and I was born and raised in the church, but I actually got saved out there, oddly enough, not in the Bible Belt, <laughs> uh, and then felt the Lord calling me back here, but um, yeah, so I've been back here now for quite a while, since 2005 or so, uh, that I've been back in West Tennessee, um, and then I met my wife at Union, uh, and we're married, and we have three kids, um, Ariana, who's 10, Nora, who's nine, and Elias, who is seven, and so uh, it's, it's busy around our house, but in a good way, uh, but all of that has been thrown for a loop right now with all this virtual learning, but that's a whole other conversation. Well, and I cyber stalked you just a little bit and saw sure. your family and I thought, man, I got to get them out here to Discovery Park and do a photo yes. shoot. You've got a very <laughs> beautiful, beautiful family. So, Well, I definitely, my wife actually, uh, she and I were talking, Rachel and I were talking this morning and I told her that I had this interview and she was like, oh, uh, get us tickets. <laughs> I was like, I don't know about all that, but I was like, I was like, we love the Discovery Park. So we're, we're going to make a trip up soon. I don't know about taking pictures, but, uh, yeah, but just, yeah, just, I, I, I'm blessed. Just tell her that we uh, trade tickets for photo shoots, you know, <laughs> so you guys can come and do that. Um, but yeah, now you have a beautiful family. It looks Thank like you. you guys are into it. You're at that age where the kids are into all kinds of things. But yeah. then I can't imagine with COVID, um, you know, how do sure. you parent? You know, it's crazy. I know everybody's yeah. just winging it, but man, yeah. it's tough. Yeah. yeah, it's been hard. And, um, you know, Last night, uh, my nine-year-old, well, both my nine and 10-year-old, uh, the nine-year-old started and the 10-year-old followed. Um, they both, you know, were crying when they were going to bed last night because they both have been nervous about the whole getting online and doing the classes online. And they started last week doing that. Um, and uh, one of the days, uh, the mic stopped working for a little bit and the teacher had called on my nine-year-old, Anora. And so she couldn't answer. The teacher couldn't hear. And she got, you know, all broke up about that. And so it's been hard. It's been difficult in this moment. And uh, but we're, we're we're adjusting like everyone is. And, um, you know, 
we've not been able to go places like we traditionally would have. We would have taken, you know, some trips this year probably to see family and things like that. And so that's been hard not not to see those loved ones. But um, again, these are things that all of us are, are struggling with. But at the same time, we're all very much looking forward to when this is past us. Yeah, I've got uh, college age daughters and they're doing classes, you know, the same way and my yeah. wife teaches college. And so um, it's been interesting to observe all the different ways people are, you know, using the technology to try to uh, educate. Sure. Yeah, uh, you know, we absolutely. don't want a whole generation of, uh, you know, high school, you know, elementary, high school, college age folks who missed a year. Sure. You know, yeah. So it's fascinating yeah. to watch all the educators jumping in there and, uh, you know, keeping everything going. We here at Discovery Park are, you know, finding the same thing. Of course, yeah. we would be packed with students right now on field sure. trips. Um, and so we've introduced some uh, digital field trips and things like that to try to serve the community the best we can. But, uh, you know, it's challenging at best for everybody. It is. And, it, and it's not the same. You know, again, education is in my background. And so, you know, the reality for us as human beings is that we were made to be social. We were made to be together uh, in community. Um, and so, you know, as, as great as the technology is and, and the virtual options that have made us allow to have allowed us to be able to still move forward, it ultimately is no real replacement um, for the classroom. It's no real replacement for church. It's no real replacement for, you know, uh, the uh, conventions and conferences and, and all those events that we normally take part in. But uh, it is getting us over, at least in this time. But again, you know, um, it's hard. It's hard. It's been very hard, I think, for everybody. Do you think things will come back as they were before? Or do you think we'll feel uh, changes in our society from it? Probably a little bit of both. Um, you know, I think that there will be some long term changes that, um, you know, you're, you'll see. Uh, more than likely, particularly like say in the business sector um, and even the education sector and higher education and, and, and those types of uh, avenues. Um, so as an example, um, so many of us in the business world, um, you know, we've been used to taking business trips um, to have meetings or taking business trips to go to conferences. Um, I think that long term, you're going to see a lot more virtual conferences uh, even after this is all over because people have realized we spent a lot of money on plane tickets and rental cars and all that type of stuff that maybe wasn't 100 percent necessary. Um, and those uh, resources could be better used somewhere else. So I think you're going to see some of that take place. Um, but at the same time, I feel as though I was uh, having this conversation with someone uh, just over the weekend that I feel as though probably spring, summerish, hopefully, Lord willing, when we get past all of this, if not sooner, um, that you're going to see people flocking to, um, you know, in-person events uh, as much as they can uh, when it's safe. And so, you know, I, I think it's going to be interesting. You're going to see probably a little bit of both. Well, I do think, and we're going to talk a little bit about how you're using uh, social media and technology to, sure. to to do programs, but I do think for those of us living in rural communities, it is a good opportunity to be able to have some thought leadership. You know, in the past, we would have tried mm -hmm. to fly someone in, put sure. them you know, yeah. in a the theater, and we would have tried to host something on a stage and get yeah. people here. Now, you know, it's one, two, three, boom, you know, we're right. together on the screen and we can record it. We can post yep. it on, you know, so it really, I do think, um, has pushed forward a tool that I think we're all going to use, um, yeah. In, yeah. in the future. hundred percent, hundred percent. I actually had a zoom call this morning, um, where we're planning, um, a United way event. And that's the very thing we were discussing is that this moment presents an opportunity to bring in maybe even a big name person who normally would be very hard to get. Um, and the virtual reality that we are living in has, you know, freed up their schedule, um, but also has just made this a lot easier to navigate because so many people are now using these platforms. Well, even even real foot forward, our podcast here originally, uh, Luke and I. 
uh, would sit in a room with the guest and we would have required you to work it into your schedule to yeah, come yeah, here sure. to Union City. <clears throat> we would have sat in a room together and done this because we were really focused on the quality. And so I think it's really opened up for us as well, just to get speakers. You probably wouldn't have been able to come all the way out here today. So, <clears throat> so oh, no, I, I, I definitely would have made, made the trip, um, you know, uh, to Union City. That wouldn't have been any problem. I've been in Union City a handful of times. And so, uh, no, that wouldn't have been an issue. Excellent. So let's talk a little bit, first of all, uh, before we talk about how you got your job at United Way, for those listeners, a lot of listeners may not even know what the United Way is. So yeah. tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. So United Way of West Tennessee um, is actually getting ready in this next year to celebrate our 80th anniversary. So 80 years of doing, you know, good work in uh, West Tennessee. And so uh, as an organization, we're a nonprofit um, and we focus on three primary issues. Um, so education, financial stability, um, and then also um, we focus on health. And so we believe that every single citizen in West Tennessee should have access to those three things. Um, and so that those are essentially basic human rights for everybody. Um, and so we want to have a healthy community. We want to have an educated community. Um, and we also want to have a financially stable community. Um, and so you know, we work with nonprofit partners all around West Tennessee. Uh, we actually do work in 14 counties. Um, and so we work all across West Tennessee to make sure that citizens have that, the access to those things. And we do that through partnering with uh, what we call partner agencies, so other nonprofits. So we support the work of about 69 nonprofits across West Tennessee, uh, and we support their programming. Um, so things like making sure people get food and make, making sure people get shelter, uh, making sure um, that we support uh, programs like uh, our free tax service um, so that people can file their taxes for free and get to keep more in their own pocket. Um, we also support, uh, you know, our Christmas partners initiative during uh, Christmas time to make sure that people in West Tennessee, uh, families in need, still get to celebrate Christmas um, in, in a traditional way. Um, but there's so many other things that we do as well. Um, and so, again, our kind of key focus is propping up West Tennessee, supporting our community, uh, making it to be the best that it can be. Uh, and so, again, I mentioned earlier that my great great grandfather came to West Tennessee and I tell people all the time he did that because he saw West Tennessee um, as a place of promise, as a place of opportunity. And we want to keep that uh, that reality true for every citizen of West Tennessee. So uh, you graduated from Union. Yep, what was your yep. what's what's been your career path sure. to this position as the president and CEO of United Way of West Tennessee? Yeah, so um, I graduated from Union and then actually worked at Union for eight years. Um, and so I started out in admissions there, recruiting students, and then uh, moved into the role of director of student success, um, and then um, transitioned into the, after that into our, our office of university ministries, um, where I was a director of service and diversity initiatives, um, and also director of the Center for Racial Reconciliation. And so I worked there, like I said, for almost a decade, um, and then transitioned um, back into the classroom. Um, and so. I had taught for a couple of years uh, before all of that um, as a special needs uh, assistant teacher and so really loved kids and so um, felt the Lord draw me back into uh, kind of a school, a lower uh, level school setting um, out of higher education. And so I uh, took over Hands Up Preschool, which is a nonprofit preschool here in Jackson and ran that for about two and a half years um, and then uh, got a phone call from United Way. And, um, and that was a, you know, a tough decision to make because, again, I love the kids um, and I love that program and what we were doing. And I'm very, very proud of, of that program. Um, but United Way offers, uh, presented an opportunity for uh, you know, us to be able to expand the work of what we were doing, um, to be able to reach more people, to be able to help more people. Um, and so I've been really privileged and blessed to be able to step into this role. I came into uh, this role at United Way almost a year ago, uh, and so October 1st, 2019. Um, and who would have known just a few short months later <laughs> that we would be going through a pandemic? Uh, but such is, you know, uh, Providence. And so, uh, you know, I've enjoyed my time here thus far and been very, again, privileged and thankful to be able to help so many people in our community in this short span of time. Uh, even recently, you know, helping school systems with devices so people can do virtual learning. 
Yeah, I'm curious. Um, obviously, when you start a new job, you start, you know, your first, I mean, some people say your first year in a leadership position yeah. like that is about learning and yeah, hearing from the people. And I'm new-ish as well here at Discovery Park. And so um, the game changed yeah. for, for everybody. Absolutely. Um, what are some of your takeaways for, so far? What, how have you survived this far? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, you know, I, I, I'm with you. I think initially my my game plan had been to come into this role um, and to spend the first six months to a year just learning. I'm um, learning more about United Way, learning more about um, our community, um, even though, again, I was born and raised here, um, learning more about what the needs are so that we could then come up with a strategic plan to be able to address those. Um, and the needs became immediate when the pandemic struck, um, you know, in, in a sense that, you know, that was always somewhat true, but the pandemic really shined a light on some particular needs um, in West Tennessee. And so, you know, we never shut our doors. Um, you know, I have worked from home maybe one or two days this entire time. Um, and a lot of that was because I personally believe and, and I, you know, preach this to my staff that United Way exists to serve in moments like this. Um, you know, these are the type of moments that United Way was created for. Um, and so it's our obligation to step into the gap uh, and do everything that we can to support families and, and, and people in our community. And so, um, you know, it has been a learning curve for sure. Uh, but I think that that is, um, you know, at its essence, what leadership is about. Um, leadership is ultimately, um, and again, I come from the background of having a pastoral kind of uh, undergraduate training. Uh, so I think that leadership is in that sense pastoral in the sense that it's shepherding. It's caring for people in the community. Uh, it's helping to lead and guide conversations that are important in the community. It's responding when there's something urgent that's come up. Um, and, and, you know, you're not going to always get it 100% right. Um, you're, you're not going to make every decision perfectly. However, I think that people in our community um, respect and they honor authenticity um, and they honor when they see compassion, true compassion. Um, and, and that is what I want United Way to be known for um, is that authenticity and that passion. Are you um, also pastoring a church? As well. I am an associate pastor, yeah, at a historic First Baptist Church here in Jackson. Oh, very nice. Okay, excellent. Now, coronavirus wasn't the only thing that we've been That's having right. to deal with. There's been um, a lot of uh, racial unrest, sure. which yeah. actually um, opened up an even more urgent need for dialogue. Yeah. Yep. Um, can you hit a little bit on what, how you've been approaching that and how mm -hmm. you've been uh, using technology to do so? Yeah. So um, as you mentioned, um, you know, George, the George Floyd incident happened um, now um, two and a half months ago. Um, and that really, you know, felt like a watershed moment in our country for a lot of people. Um, in a way that, you know, we've seen these type of incidents happen before. Right. You know, so that is not that it was new. Um, but it felt different. Um, and I think honestly, the piece that felt very different, particularly for, for someone like me as a person of color, um, is that I saw a lot of our white brothers and sisters joining in that dialogue, joining in that conversation, joining in even some of those peaceful protests. Um, and so that felt different. That being said, um, you know, it still was very much the first time that certain folks had ever began that dialogue. Um, and so it was important to understand that. And so for me personally, again, you know, I kind of had a background with that at Union um, because of the roles that I, that I had there. Um, and so, you know, for, I personally believe that the way forward is together. Um, you know, it, it's not, you know, we can't, um, we can't argue or debate our way um, to the future. Um, we have to do it in true, honest, um, compassionate dialogue. Um, and so we have to tell the truth about the past, but we also have to maintain hope for the future and, and where we can go as a, as a country and as a people, um, as brothers and sisters. And so we've tried to guide conversations here uh, in West Tennessee by talking honestly about the issues, but doing so in a very considerate way, um, in a way that welcomes various perspectives, 
Um, you know, I, I think unfortunately that's one of the biggest struggles right now in our in our uh, country and in our society is that it feels as though it's hard uh, to to find a middle ground. Sometimes it's hard to have you know um, dialogue in such a way that is actually uh, uh, productive. And so we want to model that. We want to model um, a community that can have that type of discussion. So for any of our listeners who maybe aren't as well versed in some of the language, um, how do you actually define racial reconciliation? Yeah, so that, that's, a, uh, that's a little bit of a tough one because uh, both of those terms, race and reconciliation, are both uh, very full <laughs> of a lot of history uh, and baggage in it to a certain degree. And so um, at its core, you know, ultimately I would say that race is a myth. Um, it's a sociological structure that was invented. Um, and so it's not really real in, in some sense. I think ethnicity is real, um, but race is not really real. You're, even though you're white and even though I am half black and half Hispanic, um, we're both part of the human race, right? Now, that being said, we are from different cultures ethnically. That's very real. Um, and sometimes that can, uh, you know, that can uh, display itself in, in our appearance. Um, but that being said, we're from the same race. And so that's, we have to establish that first because that helps us then get to the term reconciliation. Um, because reconciliation says that at one point we were actually uh, together. You know, so consider. You know, so there's some people who have debated debated the term reconciliation and conciliation. Um, reconciliation states that at one time we all were okay. Um, conciliation recognizes that maybe we weren't okay, but we're going to get there together. Um, I actually am in favor of the term reconciliation uh, because I believe that again, as a Christian, that in the garden there was a time when everything was all right. Um, and we were together and, and that ultimately that's the end goal to get us back to that place. Um, and again, a great uh, Bible story that I often like to use and, and tell to help uh, explain this is uh, Jesus and Peter um, there at the end of the uh, Gospel of John. Um, it's a very famous scene. Um, you know, Jesus has been gone for a few days um, and uh, the, the apostles aren't really quite sure what to do. He's told them to go wait in Galilee. So they, you know, Peter says, let's go fishing. They go fishing. They don't catch anything all night. Um, they see this figure appear on the shore and it's, it's ultimately ends up being Jesus. Um, he tells them to cast their nets on the other side. They do and the, you know, they fill their nets. Peter swims to the shore to get to, to Jesus. Well, they have, you know, uh, breakfast that morning. And then right after the meal, Jesus has something to talk to Peter about. And so it's the famous scene where he asks uh, Peter, do you love me three times? Um, and this is important. Um, there's much more going on in this passage than we tend to think. And a lot of it has to do with reconciliation. Because the last real conversation that Jesus and Peter had had was at the Last Supper. And that's where Peter had said, I will never deny you. I will even lay down my life for you. Um, and yet he denies him three times, which is why Jesus ultimately asked him three times, do you love me? He's pointing that out. And so I think that that's an important uh, uh, story to tell about reconciliation because Jesus does not allow it to go unaddressed. He has to point out what happened. He has to address it. But yet he loves him enough that once it's addressed, he forgives, he accepts, and they move on. Um, and so. Um, and, and part of what happens with Peter is that he's never the same again. He's a different person from that point on. And, and that is also a part of reconciliation, that we address the past, uh, we talk about the present, and then we have hope for the future uh, as new people, as different people. And so what, um, obviously, we can't all go fishing together. Sure. <laughs> um, especially during uh, a pandemic. The pandemic, yeah. Yeah, unless we wear masks, maybe. What are some of the tools and tactics that uh, you all have been uh, experimenting with, and and sure. how's that going? Yeah. So um, you you had mentioned you know kind of watching some of these uh, sessions that we posted online. Um, so we partnered together with the Jackson Chamber and our Jackson Home um, to host a, a series series of conversations. Um, talking about, you know, uh, equity. And I think that that term is really important, equity as opposed to equality. Um, equity, uh, equality says that everybody gets the same thing, but equity says that everybody gets what they need. 
Um, so an example of that would be um, if we if we saw that there's a group of people that need shoes, they don't have shoes, you know, as an example. Um, and we said, OK, let's go buy them shoes. But we bought everybody a size eight. Well, the problem is, is not not everybody has the same shoe size. Right. So uh, so the equitable thing would be to give them precisely what they need, the shoe size that they actually need. Um, and that's important when we have this conversation. So we started this series on equity um, and we talked about just, you know, the basics of racial reconciliation and just what that means. Uh, we talked about the history of racism in our country, but we also talked about, you know, how does it overset or uh, interact and, um, and uh, 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 intersect with uh, things like the criminal justice system um, or with just the community as a whole. Um, and so we discussed all of these various topics um, over the course of about four sessions, each about an hour to an hour and a half uh, long. Um, but we also hosted some um, outdoor film screenings where we uh, 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 did some uh, showings of certain films like Just Mercy, um, uh, Selma, um, The Free State of Jones, um, and others to be help begin this dialogue, to give people some resources to be able to lean on. Um, and then the thing we've done most recently is we've actually created a brand new um, initiative called the Equity Project. Um, and it's made up of uh, leaders from, uh, this is specifically within Madison County, of leaders um, uh, from around the county. It's nonpartisan, so it's Democrats and Republicans who are part of it. Um, and, and it's all people, again, who want to come together to figure out, okay, what can we do as a community to move us forward? Um, and how can we do that in a peaceful way um, and, and in a, a compassionate way? And so we've uh, put those resources online. Um, so the Equity Project has a Facebook page. Um, that series was uh, live streamed. Uh, they're still available on the United Way web, uh, web page on Facebook, uh, Facebook page rather. Um, and, and we want to just help the community continue that dialogue. So um, obviously, uh, John Lewis, years mm -hmm. and years ago, didn't have yeah. social media, didn't yeah. have Zoom. Um, what, what do you think? What do you think the uh, impact of social media has on what you're trying to accomplish now? Um, I'd say that it's both positive and negative. Um, and so, yeah, as you mentioned, someone like John Lewis, Martin Luther King, um, and others, um, you know, they, they didn't depend on social media, uh, as a platform to, to get information out. Um, it was very much word of mouth and, uh, through the churches, um, you know, through newspaper, et cetera. Um, and so today presents a different opportunity. It does allow you to get information out a whole lot faster, uh, which can be a positive thing. But at the same time, if we're not careful, um, it permits so many other things. And so, you know, I, I believe that personally, um, you know, social media can sometimes be a necessary evil. Um, I, I don't, you know, I'm not, I'm on social media because I kind of have to be for my work, um, but it's not something that I love. Um, and so I recognize the advantages of it, but I also recognize the, the weaknesses um, and the disadvantages. And so while it does allow that message to get out quickly and to reach a wider audience than maybe other platforms would have allowed for, um, you also have to deal with the negatives of, uh, you know, the anonymity of social media um, and, and therefore, um, you know, uh, the comments and all those other things. Um, and, and, you know, as, as people, you know, uh, especially something like Twitter, which limits the number of characters that you can use, which limits the message to a degree. Um, you can never tell a story completely, right? Um, it's not going to have all of the nuance and all of the context. And that's where we have to be careful too, um, is that we're trying to provide as much of that for people as we can. And so, again, that being said, we have to use it because we want to get the message out. We want to help people think deeply through these things. Um, but we also want to have a real face-to-face -face dialogue uh, as much as we can uh, as well. And again, as you mentioned, that's the hard thing right now uh, because of the pandemic. What you've obviously now set through numerous uh, programs that you've hosted. Yeah. And I know that when you're trying to host it, you're trying to pay attention to what people are saying and keep yeah. the converse, keep the ball going uh, back and forth. Um, so you can't always listen as well as, you know, and think about it, but has sure. anything uh, 
jumped out at you in all these? Have there been any aha moments or mm. um, it, has anyone said anything that you made you pause and think, you know, what, sure. talk to me a little bit about that experience. Yeah, I think that that's actually ha happened at, at some point in every session. Um, but one in particular was in the last one that we did that was, you know, on reconciliation. Um, you know, the two people that were on there, uh, William, Pastor William L. Watson uh, and Miss Olivia Abernathy are, are friends of mine. They're people that I know really well. Um, but um, the way they uh, spoke to some of these issues um, just very eloquently and again, very compassionately um, really moved me. And one of the things that Olivia discussed was um, the need for all of us to take a personal assessment. Um, to kind of truly understand where we are in this journey, um, you know, not just with racial reconciliation, but with life. Um, and, and, and for us to kind of, you know, take a step back and understand um, the advantages that we may or may not have, um, the difficulties that we may or may not have, um, the struggles we've had, um, the, the successes we've had all of those things, because every single one of those pieces shapes who we are, um, you know, every single one of us. Uh, we've had people, every single person who's alive has had someone that's, um, you know, uh, contributed to their life, you know, a teacher or a parent or a coach or a pastor, somebody um, in the community has contributed. And so it's important for us to take those self-assessments um, and then turn around and see how can we be that type of person for somebody else? Um, and, you know, ultimately, that is what community is about. Um, it's about supporting each other. Um, and so as that conversation continued, what we discussed was this reality that, um, you know, there are, there are uh, key holders. Um, they have keys to particular doors. Uh, whether that be business oriented or socially oriented or whatever that might be academic, um, they are the key holders. And it should be our goal to encourage those key holders to unlock the door for as many people as possible um, for the benefit of the community. Um, and so sometimes those key holders are us, depending on what that door is. Um, and so again, it should be our goal to serve that role in the community in such a way that it empowers people, um, regardless of their racial or ethnic background, regardless of their socioeconomic background. Um, you know, again, we live in, as you mentioned, rural West Tennessee. Um, there are several white brothers and sisters right now listening to this call who they didn't come from wealth. They didn't come from, you know, power. Um, you know, and so in that way, you know, there, there is a camaraderie that could be there. And I think that that's one of the sad realities uh, of some of our history is that we have had these uh, racial divisions in our past and even on up to the present. Um, but the reality is we have a lot more in common. And if we would try to find that common ground, I think we'd be surprised at what we could accomplish together. So again, I think that, you know, that's one of the biggest things from all of the dialogue that we did from those different discussions was that, you know, ultimately that's what it's about. It's about that common ground. So for anybody who is listening, um, you know, what uh, I know that you don't speak for the entire black community of West sure. Tennessee, but um, what is it that folks who are listening, what can they do? I know a lot of my friends have been going through a phase of listening, sure. you know, yeah. before we open our big mouths with our opinion or, or tweet our, you know, brilliant thoughts, you know, we've been listening. Um, yeah. So at some point that listening phase will end. What actions do you think uh, West Tennessee white folks like me sure. can do? Yeah. So, um, you know, first and foremost, I want to say thank you for listening. Um, again, you know, this is a conversation that has been going on for a very, very long time. Um, and, and, you know, uh, I, you know, I grew up with black and white friends and Hispanic friends and so many others. Um, and, and, you know, some of these conversations we had at different points over the years, um, but, you know, immediately in the aftermath of the George Floyd incident, I had a several, you know, even college roommates who called me and said, can we talk about this a little bit? Um, and so I've been grateful for that. Um, it's been hard. It's heavy. 
but that's part of it. Um, and so the listening piece is, is really important. But um, again, I think it ultimately, you know, I was saying this to somebody on Friday. Um, I think it was to our, our United Way intern um, who just started, you know, and she and I were talking about the work that United Way does. And I think that it, it kind of is, is similar to this type of work that we're talking about now. Um, at the end of it all, at the end of it all, um, again, and I'm speaking from a Christian perspective, and I realize that everybody listening may not be a Christian, um, but uh, I think that these principles are universal. Um, ultimately, at the end of, uh, of it all, there's two great commandments. Um, the first is to love God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. But the second is like it, love your neighbor as yourself. That second, both are incredibly important. You can't really have one without the other. Um, but I think that there are many people in our community who recognize the first principle. You know, they, we talk a lot about, you know, loving God and our faith and our religion, particularly in West Tennessee and the Bible Belt. Um, but I think that at times we've been distracted from the second. Um, and so, I, you know, I tell my kids, eh, you know, not every day, almost every day because they're young. You know, uh, when, when somebody gets in an argument with the other, I have to say to them, you know, how are we supposed to treat other people? And it's drilled into their head at this point. And they know to say the reply is um, the way that I want to be treated. And, and so I think that that, you know, that can feel generic. It can feel, you know, like it's, a, it's almost a non-answer, but it is the truth. The reality is, is that, okay, I'm going to listen to other people because I will want to be listened to. Then when I start thinking about, okay, what are my next steps? Well, how would I honestly want to be treated? If I was a part of this, you know, this, this community, um, you know, and again, you can get into whole debates about, you know, uh, using certain terms like uh, th this uh, group that is oppressed, this group that is downtrodden, this group that is taken advantage of, right? We could get in, you know, we could have debates about all that language. But the reality is, is that they, that you have a community that feels that way, right? So, so as an example, if I have a family member that feels hurt and burdened and stressed, now, of course, I could go to that person and go, why in the world do you feel that way? That's just not true. You're not any of those things. And there may be a time where you do do that. But most people, 95% of the time, they would approach that person if they honestly want to help by, uh, by first recognizing that pain, recognizing that, that, that feeling, that emotion, and try to help that person work through that. And so again, the reason why is because that's the way they will want to be treated. And so some you know, really concrete examples um, uh, of response would be, okay, now that you've listened, begin a dialogue. Begin to talk with people about what you've listened to and what you've heard and begin to ask questions, ask real questions. Um, ask questions about where can, I, where can I help in the community? What can I do? Um, and then be willing to listen to that response back um, and then evaluate that. Um, and again, ask, take that self um, reflection Think about, you know, where, where do I have advantages that I could use for the benefit of others? Um, and, and, and then once you identify where those advantages are, actually use them to help other people. Um, and again, this goes beyond race. Um, race is what we're talking about. It's incredibly important, um, but it goes beyond that. Um, again, poor doesn't care what color you are at the end of the day, right? It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't care about that. And so in a place like Union City um, in O'Brien County, again, you have uh, in neighboring counties, Lake County and others, you have folks that are hurting that aren't the color, same color as I am. And I have to be willing to sacrifice for them in the same way that I sacrifice for people that do look like me. And that's what I'm asking for everybody else. That's the exact same thing. If I, as an as a African-American man, I have to be willing to sacrifice for my white brother. And that's all I'm asking in return is that he would sacrifice in the same way. Um, and so, you know, that's why that self-reflection is so important um, in identifying those areas of, again, advantage or what some would call privilege, um, what, the, what those are. And they're not the same for everybody. 
we don't mean by privilege that everybody was born with a silver spoon in their mouth. Not at all. Not at all. That's not what we mean. Um, but rather, um, again, just identifying those areas where you hold the keys. And maybe you kind of look at your keychain and go, I don't have many keys at all. <laughs> and you go, OK, OK, well, let's dialogue, because guess what? There's a whole other community that feels that exact same way. So you guys have a lot in common. That's incredible. You took us to church today. I don't know about all that. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's incredibly helpful. Um, what's next? What, what have you got cooking? Yeah, so um, again, we've initiated this equity project. Um, and so we're really excited about that. And, and we're getting ready. We're building a website right now. Um, and we're, we're working on some initiatives, um, some various initiatives uh, to support people in our community. So as an example, and I guarantee that this is not, you know, um, this issue is not Madison County specific. This, this type of stuff happens all across the state, all across the country. Um, you know, there's been a lot, a lot of debate and dialogue in our community about our jail. Um, we're expanding our jail here in, in, in Jackson. And so, um, you know, one of the things that we've discovered is that we have this, you know, um, overpopulated jail building. Um, and somewhere around 70 to 75% of those people are there simply because they cannot afford to pay, uh, pay bail. Um, and so essentially they're being punished for being poor, um, you know, uh, just as much as they're being punished for maybe a crime that they committed. Uh, and so we're having discussions right now about creating a bail fund that will help people get out of that situation. So, you know, if you've been pulled over and, you know, for what, for one reason or another, maybe you're driving on a suspended license or whatever it might be, and you're taken to jail and you have to pay a bail. If you can't do that, you got to sit there until the court date. Um, and so you're not sitting there because of this horrible thing you did. You're sitting there simply because you can't afford to pay the bail. And so we're having discussions about that. Uh, we're talking about collaboration with our police department. Um, and so uh, one of the conversations we're having right now is about creating a PAL, a P-A-L, which is a... a police athletic league. Um, and so it's a way for the police to interact with the community. Um, and so we're talking about creating a boxing club uh, where police officers can, um, can volunteer and they can work with these young men and, and give them another outlet. Um, and so we're discussing that right now and, 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 uh, and working on that piece. Um, we're also talking about um, several other things that we can do to support the community um, and support our law enforcement officers. You know, we're really blessed here that we have for the most part a really great um, police department. And so, you know, we don't wanna villainize them if they're doing good jobs. We wanna celebrate when they do good. Um, now, that being said, if they do something wrong, we have to be willing to talk about that truth, that too. In the same way, and again, <laughs> talk about taking us to church, I gotta be willing to call out a pastor who ain't doing what he's supposed to do. I got to be willing to call out, you know, politicians. I got to be willing to call out principals. I got, you know, it goes across the gamut. And that's where when I think that that's what's hard in this moment is that there can feel like inconsistency in the messaging. I got to be willing to call out, you know, other people that look like me when they're, when they do something wrong, there has to be consistency across the board. Um, and so we want to be fair in that way. We want to be equitable. Um, but we also have to be realistic about the things that got us here. Um, and so, uh, in fact, on Twitter, uh, talking about social media earlier, I read this post this morning that I found very compelling. Um, and so uh, this was from um, a woman and she posted uh, this passage she had been reading from Jeremiah, I believe it's Jeremiah 13. Um, but in that passage, uh, the Jer Jeremiah, the weeping prophet, is prophesying against um, the uh, king of Israel. And the reason being is because he built his palace using slave labor. That's, that's literally what the passage says, that he, he oppressed those people and he did wicked in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord has not forgotten that. And Jeremiah says that there will be a day of reckoning for that. And so that's why we can't ignore the, the lessons of our history. We have to be willing to face the past of, of how this country was built and, and the backs on the people that, that built it, that, that, you know, that, that, that was leaning on. Um, and then take from that, I'm not saying that, you know, all, all those people were evil. They were people true enough of their time, but we have to be willing that that because of those 
things that took place, it has advantaged certain ones of us and disadvantaged others of us. Um, and, and that we have to work collectively together as a group to bring equity for everybody. And so again, you're gonna continue to hear more conversations about that coming from the equity project, uh, but you're gonna see us also um, working together collectively as a community um, to make a better Jackson and ultimately a better West Tennessee, uh, because we do see this work expanding out over time. You know, one of your in one of your programs, uh, someone talked about the role of historic and generational trauma in the black sure. community. And that's yeah. something that I hadn't really thought about. And so that Absolutely. was that was really uh, enlightening. Um, where can uh, someone find out more information about the project? Yeah, so again, um, they can look for Jackson Equity Project on Facebook. Um, you'll see our Facebook page. Um, again, we're building a website right now that we hope to have up in the next uh, two, couple of weeks, more than likely. Um, the videos that, again, that we've discussed, they can find on the United Way uh, page under our video section of Facebook. Um, and, and again, we want to offer these things as resources uh, for a place for people to begin the conversation if they have questions. Um, so even as you mentioned, you know, that generational trauma, um, I think that there are several people in our community that can um, uh, empathize with that because they had family members come back from Vietnam. They had family members come back um, from, um, you know, other wars and other, you know, combat zones. Um, even grandfathers and great grandfathers that came back from World War II and World War I. Um, and, you know, I had a cousin that came back from Afghanistan and has never been the same. He wasn't the same bright, uh, bright hearted, um, you know, uh, exuberant cousin that I grew up with. He came back different. And many of us have that story in our families. And so, you know, that's the reality. You know, we talk about ACEs, which is adverse childhood experiences. Um, those are those are traumatic events that, that children experience growing up. Um, and what doctors have found out now, they've identified that that literally changes the biology and chemistry of a, of a person. And so, you know, thinking about that, you know, it, it, it shouldn't be surprising that there are whole communities that have grown up with that type of trauma. And so how do we address that and work together as a community to address that? And so you'll hear us talking about more of that. So you're, um, I mean, you are involved in all these really, uh, crucial things going on. We're in the middle of a pandemic. You're trying to be a dad, a husband, and a pastor. What does Matt do for fun? <laughs> uh, read. Uh, I uh, just finished a book this morning, and so I try to read if I can. Um, my wife and I love to watch movies, um, so uh, we have a, a family movie night, which is typically Friday nights with the kids, and then we have a family game night that we've recently initiated, uh, which is Saturday nights. And so right now in the middle of the pandemic, it is spending time at home with the kids, you know, enjoying them. That's what we do for fun. Um, but I hope that it will be soon coming to Discovery Park, <laughs> being able to do things like that. Absolutely. So, uh, absolutely. And, you know, whenever you guys are ready, we'll set up VIP passes. Oh, we'll, you know, that's we'll, not we'll roll out the red carpet. <laughs> Thank you so much for all that you're doing um, in West Tennessee. And also thank you for taking the time out of your day to join us here on Real Foot Forward. Thank you for having me. It's, it's, I really appreciate it. And thank you for the opportunity to, to share the platform and to talk about what, what's going on. Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. Be sure to like, subscribe, and leave us a review. Start planning your visit to Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com. And also be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates.